So with that, we are going to start the official program of this webinar. And I would like to invite uh, Lenneke Berghout, who is an independent garden history researcher and who has a PhD on the gardeners of the Princess of uh, Orange from in the 17th and 18th century, to start this session with uh, her contribution of the importance of water and the profession of fountaineer in the 17th century. Lenneke. Thank you, Renske. Good morning, everyone. Uh, when you visit uh, Low Palace, some of you may have visited the palace, some of you may in the future, but when you visit the palace and you enter the garden from the palace, the first thing that draws your eye is the king's fountain. You can see it in the picture here. It's, it's a beautiful sight today, and it must have been a spectacular sight in the late 17th century when it was constructed. The fountain spouts 13 meters high, and at the time, it was the highest fountain in Europe. It was uh, constructed by uh, order of William III, King Stadtholder William III. And the fountain at Low uh, Garden was higher than the fountains at Versailles. And since the French King Louis XIV was a very important political rival of William III, this very high fountain sent a very clear message Mine is bigger than yours. And everyone would have understood that message <clears throat> at the time. Now the King's Fountain is just one of many extraordinary waterworks in the garden. No expense was spared to impress visitors with a multitude of fountains, cascades and ponds. For instance, there were two large cascades placed opposite each other in the lower garden. You can see one of them in the picture. And the cascade is an artificial waterfall where the water flows down the steps, the stone steps, as you can see here. <clears throat> Sorry about that. All the waterworks had beautiful decorations. Near this cascade, you can see Arian, the singer, who is playing his zither and uh, who is standing on a dolphin. Now, all these waterworks were an essential part of the garden and constant maintenance was needed to keep fountains spouting or jumping, as they called it in the 17th century. You might think that maintaining uh, all these waterworks was the responsibility of the head gardener, but in the Netherlands in the 17th century, uh, a special employee was appointed to maintain the fountains and the ponds and the cascades. And this employee was called the fountaineer. So I would like to introduce you to some of these fountaineers and talk a bit about the work they did. When William III <coughs> appointed his first fountaineer for the gardens at Low Palace, he followed in his grandparents' footsteps, Prince Frederick Henry and Princess Amalia. Frederick Henry and Amalia had a number of gardens laid out around the Hague and fountains were a very important part of these gardens. And to design and construct these fountains, they engaged Joseph Dinan from the early on words. Joseph Dinan was probably born in present day Belgium, but he was living in the Hague when Frederick Henry commissioned him to make a number of fountains. <clears throat> He manufactured fountains for both the garden of Huis de Nieuwburg and Hansleisdijk, as well as some grottoes. On the picture, you can see a bird's eye view of the gardens of Huis de Nieuwburg. And in it, there were four ponds with, <coughs> with two fountains. It's a small picture, but I hope you can get an idea of how important and how magnificent these fountains were. Now, Joseph Dinan was held in high esteem, and as a token of appreciation for his work, he received a bonus of no less than 3,000 guilders, which was an enormous amount of money at the time. And Princess Amalia also entrusted him with the keeping of her very precious porcelain collection, which consisted of over more than 500 pieces. And when Prince Frederick Henry passed away in 1647, Joseph Dinan was invited to join the funeral procession. And you can see a picture of this procession on the left-hand side. And in the top, you can see over here, he was not called a fountaineer, but a grottier. So someone who took care of the grottoes. Uh, 
Now for Joseph Dinan, we do not have a deed of appointment with work instructions, but fortunately we have some deeds of appointment of the fountaineers of Low Palace. And the most important fountaineer at Low was Rutger van Kleef. After taking an oath of allegiance and of integrity, he started working at Low Palace on November 1st, 1693. He was a very well-educated man he with quite a nice fortune and he had just the right contacts. He had previously worked as an independent fountain maker for the court of the Princess of Orange of Nassau. And in the picture you see the first part of his deed of appointment and work instructions. As an independent fountain maker, before he was appointed as fountaineer of uh, Low Garden, he had made, for example, uh, constructed and designed the tritons of the Venus fountain in the garden of Low. You can see the tritons he made um, in, the, in the picture. And these tritons are creatures that are half man, half fish, and they blow on skunk horns to calm the sea. Exactly how and where Rutger van Kleef learned his craft, we don't know, but he must have read all the treatises that were available on fountains and waterworks, and he probably visited all kinds of waterworks to get an idea how they functioned. Now, the main task of the fountaineers at Low uh, Palace was to make sure running water was available at all time, and that the fountain spouted when the water was turned on. In his deed of appointment, it was specifically mentioned that the water should flow and a fountain should spout without fail. The gardens at Low Palace were ideally situated for waterworks, being in a relatively low area compared to the surrounding hills. Through an elaborate system of small creeks, a water reservoir and long distance water pipes, water from springs on higher grounds reached the gardens at Low Palace. The original terracotta water pipes you see in the picture were part of this system. These pipes bear the seal of King Stadthouder William III. And through lead, copper and wooden pipes, the water fed the various fountains. And due to the relatively low position, position of the garden, the water made quite a drop. And by narrowing the pipes as they neared the fountain, extra water pressure was created, which enabled the fountains to spout high, up to 13 meter. For everything to work properly, it was important that the pipes were well laid, that there were no kinks, no holes and no cracks, and of course, that the pipes did not get clogged. That meant the entire system <coughs> of creeks and long distance pipes needed inspecting every single day to prevent any blockage and to repair any holes and cracks. And in addition, the fountain taps needed lubricating on a regular basis. <clears throat> the fountaineer had eight assistants to help him do this job. There was a carpenter to maintain the wooden pipes, a plumber to solder the lead and copper pipes and the taps. Then there were three supervisors to check the springs and creeks every single day. And to make sure they did a good job, the fountaineer himself also had to take a look at the springs, the creeks, and the pipes from time to time. To prevent any frost damage in winter, three assistants had to drain the pipes before the onset of winter. And then they had to cover the stone step of the cascades and the lead pipes with leaves and horse manure to prevent any damage. Fresh horse manure, as you probably know, gives off heat for quite some time. Now, this covering of the steps and pipes was so important that the fountaineer himself had to be present to check if everything was done well. And of course, in spring, the assistant had to remove all the leaves and the horse manure and clean everything. The many decorations on the fountain, such as the spouting dolphins you see in the picture, also required a lot of attention. They were made of lead, all these decorations, and then were painted over. They had to be kept clean, and any cracks or other damage had to be repaired instantly. 
Beside the waterworks, the fountaineer was also responsible for looking after the grottoes. In the 17th century, these grottoes were a much appreciated feature in gardens. The one in this picture is at Low Palace. Now using stones and a kind of cement, grottoes were constructed and richly decorated with all kinds of unusual stones and shells, as you can see in this picture. It is quite refined. These shells, by the way, were very expensive at the time and not easily available. So using all these shells was a great way to show off your wealth and your ability to get hold of these rarities. Quite often, shells and stones would come loose and had to be put back. So you can imagine the fountaineer had his work cut out for him. The fountaineer's salary reflected the importance of his position. He earned a whopping 900 guilders. Just to give you an idea, the head gardener at Lowe earned 500 guilders, which was what a well-trained earned, well -trained craftsman would earn at the time. So the fountaineer earned almost double that amount. And perhaps it was this difference in salary that strained the relationship between the head gardener and the fountaineer sometimes. We know there was some friction concerning the tips given by visitors. In Dutch, the word is drinkgeld, which means drinking money. So it was obvious what the tips were used for. Now, initially, all these tips went to the head gardener, but the fountaineer did not agree with this practice. He argued that visitors also came to see the fountains and cascades, and maybe they came especially to see these. So to prevent any more tension, it was decided that the tips had to be shared in a fair way, so the money was split and they both got half of it. And it was a really nice amount of money they would get every year. Being a fountaineer also meant free housing, especially for Rutger van Kleef. A beautiful house was built. You can see it on the left hand side of the picture. Uh, by the way, the head gardener had quite the same uh, uh, um, house at the other side of the uh, palace. But it's very beautiful, it, it's rather large, and he lived there for free, it was part of uh, his income, and he also received free peat to warm the house. And in addition, he was exempted from local taxes, which was quite, uh, quite nice, because there were taxes on everything ranging from beer to grains to everything. Rutger van Kleef, fountaineer Rutger van Kleef, died in 1709. And he was succeeded by his wife, Margareta van der Gagel. Now, married women were considered legally incapable and were therefore unable to hold a paid job. However, this does not apply to widows, since they needed to be able to earn an income. So Margarethe van der Gagel asked permission to continue her husband's job and was granted permission. And she worked as a fountaineer for almost 20 years, up to her death in 1727. She got very little credit for her work though, because after the death of William III in 1702, the garden and its waterworks deteriorated rapidly due to lack of money. Moreover, the water pipes were sabotaged by local millers who also needed the, weather, the water to operate their mills. So slowly but surely, the fountains and cascades fell into disrepair, as did the profession of fountaineer. After Margaret died, it became a side job for an old and loyal servant. And when he in turn died, instead of appointing a new fountaineer, the head gardener at Low, Guard at Low Palace was given the additional responsibility of maintaining the waterworks. And that decision put a final end to the position of fountaineer once and for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lenneke, for this beautiful contribution for this start of uh, starting in the 17th century and giving a face more or less to this very uh, special profession of a fontaineer, showing indeed how important water was in this 17th century and how much uh, money they were willing to, to pay for all the different materials for the salary of a fontaineer and everything.